Hello everyone, this is your professor, Dennis Wise, and I just would like to take a few moments to give you a quick video explanation of our grading rubric. Um, you see here on our screen, here's the grading rubric. This can be found on our syllabus. This is what I use for all our short essays and our take-home final exam. And so you want to make sure that you're familiar enough with the basic concepts because these are what I will be referring to as I grade your papers and then give feedback of my own on those papers. Uh, so we'll just go through this list um, straight through. Uh, the first thing I want you to pay attention to is organization. Uh, I mean something very basic like this. Um, any sort of essay is going to have an introduction, it's going to have a conclusion, it will have body paragraphs. Now, to get a little bit more in depth, um, a good, well-structured essay in its introduction will have a thesis statement. Your thesis statement is going to address the prompt of the essay, uh, the essay prompt that you are working with. You make sure you answer that question. And it's going to give a brief explanation of how you think you're going to prove that thesis. Um, if you want a good example of some introductions and conclusions that will be effective, there are some links here you can pick. I'm just going to look at the introductions page really quickly because I want to show you some very common not great introductions that people tend to fall into, and I have seen a lot in our essays. So what I most often encountered, um, the strong introduction is going to have your thesis statement. It's going to make a specific claim, uh, something that's arguable, um, about the topic of the prompt that you're working with. So if I ask you to choose between the two-part structure in Beowulf or the three-part structure, you will pick one and explain why in your thesis statement, which could be one or two sentences. Um, what I often see for writers who are not that confident in either the text they're working with or with what argument they actually want to make, um, you might often see what's called a placeholder introduction, where you see a bunch of verbiage that doesn't actually answer the prompt very directly. Sometimes people just restate the prompt themselves, and that's actually effective sometimes. Um, if you could use some of the language in the prompt in your introduction, that's great as a way to jump off the answer to provide your own thesis. However, if you just stop with rephrasing the question, that doesn't give me any value, your reader any valuable information for going through your essay. Um, Webster dictionary uh, Webster's dictionary definitions as a ways of way of doing an introduction, they're okay. They tend to be done to death and not be very interesting. Um, more importantly, though, there's a lot of dawn of man types of introductions. So what I sometimes see with these introductions is you might have some general claim like all people, you know, know what it's like to feel the, that they want revenge or whatever the case may be. And that's okay. Maybe generally that's true. But when you're doing it literary analysis based on a particular text, you want to make sure your claims are going to be focused in that text. So whatever, uh, if we're doing Beowulf, according to this text, I will argue this based on this information from the poem Beowulf. So you always want to be very specific in the claims you make in your introductions. Um, after organization, again, introduction, body, conclusion. I just I give a lot of credit for original thinking here. So an important part of your essays is telling me that what you have learned in class, things that we've talked about in class. So if we have a if we have a short lecture or a homework assignment, you know, it's okay to incorporate that information into your essay. Tell me that you've been paying attention to class. So that's one part of it. But I also want to see you thinking about whatever text we're working with. So again, if we're talking about Beowulf, the poem, um, tell me what you've learned in class, but also tell me what you think, what is true, what is not true. Let me see something original from you. It doesn't have to be earth shattering, but show me that you've put some thought into this, some basic original thinking, and I give a lot of credit for that. Uh, criteria C is going to be textual evidence, um, and this is where I want people to basically work closely with the text. Um, what scenes, what lines, what characters are going to help you prove your thesis? And this is where you have to do a lot of citation from the text. So according to this scene where the character says, this line, this is what we understand. This is what is true. And so we actually pay a lot, I pay a lot of attention to textual evidence. Um, 
If there's no quotes in your paper, that's probably a problem. That probably shows that you're not working very closely with your paper. Conversely, what I sometimes see is some people insert quotes that are entirely random. They have nothing to do with the sentence that precedes it or the sentence that follows it. That is almost worse than having no quotes at all because it shows me that you know you have to incorporate quotes, but you don't understand the quote enough to actually put it into context and so that you have a decent flow to your essay. Um, a good way to around that problem of random quotes is this link about avoiding quote bombs. If you've never encountered the phrase quote bomb, it's basically where you insert a random quote into the text and then you move on as if you had never seen it or heard of it before in your life. This uh, link about quote bombs actually takes you to a little YouTube video. The first minute is a little bit boring, um, but basically the basic format for any good quote, you're going to want some sort of statement that leads up to the quote. Uh, some sort of introduction to that quote. Then you have the quote itself, uh, followed by a page number, that's MOA citation. And then this is the important part. You're going to need some sort of statement discussing the quote. Sometimes you could just tell me what the quote means. Sometimes you're going to tell me explicitly how that quote relates to the argument you're making. But this is actually a very important feature for incorporating quotes into a literary analysis paper. Introduce the quote, quote the quote, explain the quote. And if you manage to do that, it's going to make your writing seem very strong, which is so you get a lot of credit for that. Uh, next, criteria D, specificity. Um, again, part of the point of these essays, um, at least at this kind of at this level, is showing me that you've read the text under discussion. Uh, come right out and say it. Um, don't simply say um, Beowulf as a character um, rescued this person, uh, or he fought that person. Tell me who he fought. Tell me, give me names. Give me concrete situations. Explain to me the context of any reference to the text that you're making. So basically, show me that you know what you're talking about. The problem with this sometimes is that, okay, people have read the text, they know what's going on, they know the plot, they feel very confident. The downside to being specific is that sometimes people want to do plot summary and only plot summary. What you have to remi remember is that for an analytical essay, like what we're doing, you are composing an argument meant to support your thesis. Your thesis is your argumentative claim. Your body paragraphs are supporting that argument. What happens if I see plot summary? That tells me that you do not know how to prove your argument. And this especially happens if plot summary happens for like a paragraph or more. It tells me that you maybe know the basics of the plot, but how are those plot points helping you prove your argument that you stated in your introduction as your thesis? That is what I'm very interested in seeing. So plot summary goes on for too long, especially a paragraph or longer. That tells me that you've lost the train of your own argument. Likewise, if you're not specific enough, you might be making argument of claims, but I don't understand how those claims are uh, resulting naturally from the evidence from the text. So you need a happy medium between being specific with the plot and then going overboard with plot summary. And that's what I mean by specificity. Uh, criteria E is what we call comprehensiveness. If you are making an argument and you only reference the first half of a book or a poem, um, that's a little bit odd. Sometimes that's justified. I've seen arguments like that. I've given good grades to arguments like that, if justified. But it's also the case that you want to pay attention to, you want to make sure that you are using all the text, evidence from the text available in order to prove your argument. If you use just the first half of a short story or a poem or a novel, you better be because there's nothing relevant to your argument in the second half. And if, if there is, you know, I'll probably mention, we'll probably be mentioning it in class as well, but you want to be sure that you understand the entire text and that you're incorporating that information into your argument if necessary. Criteria F is just about flow. Um, use transitions. Make sure your paragraphs are logical, logically built off one another. Um, 
proofreading, that's self-explanatory. Uh, we do have a course style sheet. As I explained, a style sheet is useful because it helps standardize some things that are very, very common. Um, most classes won't give you one, but as someone who works for academic journals and does a lot of freelance editing, they're super ed useful for any publisher or um, ed editor because it gives you a lot of standards that you can work with. So, for example, here's our style sheet. Um, got a header, margins, font. This is what the style sheet just tells you. This be, and this is mostly applicable to most of the classes you'll take. For an online class, I prefer things single-spaced, although for most in-person classes, they like things double-spaced. Um, have a title. Um, essay should be written in paragraph form. One thing I often see, people insert an extra line between paragraphs. Web articles do that, but never do that for written work. It doesn't make any sense. You won't see that in published writing. Uh, likewise, um, things like titles, if it's long, it needs to be in italics. If it's short, it needs to be in quotation marks. Uh, most of the stuff you probably have encountered before. This style sheet just lays it out very nicely for you. Finally, the final criteria is the professional submission of the manuscript. That basically means that if you're following the style sheet, um, you will do well with proofreading and professional submission in the manuscript. This basically means when you submit this paper to me, does it look like you've submitted a real essay or if you just some crazy, send it, don't send in some crazy thing. Show that you put a little bit of effort into it. Um, and it's just from a rhetorical standpoint, a professional submission of anything, whether a coursework or for work work, shows, um, it speaks well to your audience. All right. So those are the major criteria. Um, good luck.